Welcome to this week's Pass the FE Exam video. In this week's episode, we are going to calculate the internal forces of trusses using the method of joints. This is a classic example that you might encounter in the static section of the FE exam. This problem was created and solved by mechatronical engineer Shante van der Schwey and is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams since 1975. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE exam the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. With study guides, practice exams, and more, the PPI Learning Hub offers digital practice and review that you can take with you anywhere you have a device so that you can prepare during the times most convenient for you. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE exam prep. Let's dive in. Today we're going to tackle a common engineering problem, calculating the internal forces of truss members using the method of joints. Our truss diagram has five joints and external forces at play. Specifically, a five kilonewton horizontal load at joint D, a five kilonewton vertical load at joint C, and known reactions at jo joint A. Joint E's vertical reaction force is unknown, and our task is to calculate the force in member BD. There are multiple possible correct answers given to us from A to D. Before delving into the calculations, let's briefly revisit the nature of a truss. It's a structural element composed of straight members connected at their ends, typically forming a triangular structure. Joints are pin connections and they are assumed to be frictionless, so only axial forces like tension or compression forces come into play. A good place to start with these kinds of problems is to first determine the reactions at the supports especially if some of the forces are already known. And as we can see, this is the case for joint A. We start off by drawing a free body diagram for this point, first including the two kilonewton force in the X direction, and then including the four kilonewton force in the Y direction. Hereafter, we include the force exerted by member AC. And as you can see, this force acts on joint A at an angle of 60 degrees. I drew this member as if it were in compression, but before calculation, we have no way of being sure whether this is true. You could have easily started it off by assuming that the member was in tension, but what is most important about this step is that you stick to the same convention, and later on, that you stay on top of which members have been proven to be a tensile or compressive load. Finally, we can include force A, B, which completes our free body diagram for joint A. From this free body diagram, we must now find two equations, describing the sum of the forces in the x and y direction. By choosing right as the positive x direction, the sum of the forces in the x direction is given by the equation force of AB, negative 2, negative force of AC, cosine 60 is equal to 0. Notice how we included only the horizontal components of that force AC. And this component can be easily solved for by making use of a trigonometric ratio, which states that cosine 60 is equal to the adjacent edge over the hypotenuse. Now this first equation still contains two unknowns, so we can't solve it yet, but we can continue to write the equation for the sum of the forces in the y direction, which is given by 4 negative FAC sine 60 equals 0. This equation contains only one unknown, meaning we can solve for the force AC by rewriting the equation. Force AC equals 4 divided by sine 60, resulting in a value of 4.6188 kilonewton. To determine whether this force is in compression or tension, we can simply look at our free body diagram again. Member AC was originally chosen to exert a compressive force on joint A. And since the magnitude of the force was found to be positive, our original assumption was true. The member was in fact in compression. A negative magnitude would have indicated that the force was in tension 
and that our original assumption was wrong. Solving for force AC now enables us to solve for force AB using the first equation we derived. Member AB is found to experience a force of 4.3094 kN in tension. From this example, it can be noted that while using the method of joints, we can only start at a joint that has a maximum of two unknown member forces, since we only have two equations to solve for those initial unknowns. By looking at the larger picture, force EY can also be solved for by taking a moment balance about joint A. We do this by noticing that the two 5 kN loads create a moment about A that must be balanced by the force EY. With the distance between A to B given as 1 meter, we can see that the first force has a moment arm of 0.5 meters about A, while the second 5 kN force requires us to solve for the distance using the Pythagorean theorem. Lastly, we notice that EY acts at 2 meters from point A, which now allows us to write the full equation. 5 times 0.5 plus 5 square root 1 squared negative 0.5 squared negative EY times 2 equals 0. With EY now known, we can now move on to determine the reactions at the other support E. We start off as we did with support A by drawing the free body diagram of the joint. One thing to note is that joint E won't have any reaction force in the X direction due to the rollers that are supporting it. From this free body diagram, the equations in the X and Y direction can be found as before. In the X direction, the equation is given by force of DE cosine 60 negative force of BE equals zero. And in the Y direction, the equation is given by negative force of DE sine 60 plus 3.4151 equals zero. The second equation now allows us to solve for the force in member DE, and it is found to be 3.9434 kN. And since this value is positive, we know that our initial assumption of compression was correct. With force DE known, we can also use the first equation to solve for force BE, and we find that it is equal to 1.9717 kN in tension. We have now successfully found the forces in members AC, AB, BE, and DE, which allows us to finally solve for the force in member BD. We start off by drawing the free body diagram for joint D again, ensuring that we draw force DE as a compression force, since this is what it was found to be while evaluating joint E. Choosing the correct direction for this force is crucial, since choosing the opposite would result in errors in your calculation. It could always be chosen as a tension force, but this would require you to substitute its known force as a negative value. Whichever you decide to do, I highly recommend you choose a convention that you're comfortable with and stick to it. Lastly, I have chosen member BD to act as a tensile force, since this will allow it to cancel out the force exerted by, by member DE. By inspecting the free body diagram, we notice that the sum of the forces in the y direction allows us to solve for force BD as the only unknown. The equation is 3.9434 sine 60 negative force of BD sine 60 equals zero. Using this equation, the force in member BD is finally found to be 3.9434 kN. And since the value is positive, we know that our original tension assumption was correct. And there you have it. The correct answer to our question is D. As we wrap up, remember a few key points for mastering trust problems. One common mistake is incorrectly choosing the sign conventions for forces, so it is important to always distinguish between tension and compression. As for finding a solution, start out with a free body diagram at each joint to visualize the forces. Hereafter, apply the equations of equilibrium. That is, the sum of the forces in the x direction and y direction should always be zero. The same goes for a moment balance at a joint. Lastly, hone your skills by practicing with various truss configurations and loading conditions. Well, thank you, Shante. I hope you found this week's video helpful. In upcoming videos, we will answer more of your FE exam questions and run through more practice problems. Pass the FE exam will publish videos weekly, so please be sure to click that subscribe button 
as you'll get expert tips and tricks, including practice problem solutions weekly to ensure that you pass the FE exam. And please, I encourage you to ask questions in the comments below this video, and I will read and respond to them in future videos. Maybe there's a specific topic you want me to cover or a question you need answered. We'll pass the FE exam. We'll have you covered. I'll see you next week on Pass the FE Exam. Thank you.